Well, next I want to introduce uh, Dennis Brennan. You've heard me talk about Dennis a little bit. Now you have an opportunity to meet him. Uh, tonight he's going to talk about uh, photography of our models. Uh, he's a professional photographer. And like I say, he's one of the uh, the two that uh, Cal Mac calls when they need to lay out uh, photographs. So Dennis, thanks so much for being here tonight. Really looking forward to this. Well, thank you, Jim. Um, and uh, good, evening. good evening, everybody. Um, as Jim said, I'm a commercial photographer and I've been doing this for over 50 years and shooting layouts and covers for classic toy trains for the last 30. Um, I've also shot layouts for, or not layouts, but I've also provided photos for O'Gage Railroading and Model Railroader. And I, I'm an old film guy. And <laughs> I thought doing a presentation on Model Railroad photography um, should be a snap. <laughs> Um, and if I was only talking about doing 35 millimeter, then um, that would be the case. However, I know what some of you must be thinking. Wait a minute, Dennis, wait a minute. When we were doing 35, we had to wait until we got our pictures back um, before we knew what we had. With digital photography, we can see exactly what we have right now. Well, but with the immediacy of digital photography. So with the immediacy of digital photography, it's often what you don't see that may get you in trouble. Uh, however, before we get into that, here are six fundamental rules that um, you need to look at. Number one, don't use a flash. On-camera flash creates a glare. The foreground often becomes washed out or overexposed while the background may be too dark or underexposed. Number two, don't increase the ISO. That is the camera's sensitivity light. Doing that only introduces unnecessary noise or drain into your photo. Number three, do use the smallest aperture um, or opening, the largest net F number like F22. I know that seems counterintuitive, but <laughs> um, the larger the number, the smaller the aperture or opening that lets the light in. Um, in see number, number th three, do use manual settings for aperture, exposure time and focus. Manual settings will provide the maximum control for aperture, exposure, time, and focus. And number four, um, do use the smallest lens aperture, just like I said, and because stopping down or closing your lens to its smallest aperture provides the maximum depth of field. Manual settings for exposure time will help you to understand how changing your exposure affects the photo and will often differ from your camera's auto setting. And five, a shutter speed from two to eight seconds is not uncommon. So using um, a tripod is critical. And finally, using a self timer or a remote trigger eliminates the camera shake from manually pressing the, sum, sh the shutter. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about color temperature and lighting. Color temperature, or many of you are probably aware that traditional incandescent household light bulbs that we all grew up with are very warm in comparison to daylight. And that's because these two light sources have very different color temperatures expressed in degrees Kelvin. Without getting overly technical, let's just say the higher the color temperature, the bluer or cooler the light. Direct sun plus skylight has a color temperature of about 55 to 6,500 degrees Kelvin. Very blue in contrast to regular light bulbs, which are in the range of 27 to 3,000 K. The old standard tube type fluorescent lights, 
and the more recent screw-in compact fluorescent lights, CFLs, come in several different color temperatures. Warm white, cool white, and daylight are the most common. Unlike incandescent lights, fluorescent lights have a discontinuous color spectrum, which means they're deficient in certain colors. That's why things sometimes look more blue or green under fluorescent lighting. Today, LEDs, which use a similar color temperature range, are rapidly replacing these sources. And like fluorescents, however, do not present a perfect color spectrum. Okay. Now, the all, the, back in the day, film was rated for either daylight or professional 3200K tungsten lights. So the correct color balance was achieved by matching the film to the light source or by placing color temperature, colored compensating filters on the camera or in front of the lights. Getting accurate color under fluorescent lights was difficult at best. Enter the digital camera with auto white balance. It seems easy, but if you're not careful, you'll shoot yourself in the foot. Your camera's auto white balance can only do so much. And what it can't do is provide accurate color under diverse color temperatures. For example, some modelers prefer to mix cool white fluorescent tubes with incandescent track lights for layout lighting. The thought being that the warm bulbs offset the starkness of the cool fluorescent tubes and produce a more natural look. But your camera will not see it that way as evidenced in this photo that's up right now. The test photo is an extreme example where I lit the foreground and background with different color temperature fluorescent bulbs. And the difference, as you can see, is striking. Setting the white balance to the correct 2700K foreground light renders the 4100K background light very blue. Now, if we set the background white to 4100K, look what happens to the foreground. The foreground gets very warm in comparison, but the background is still a little bit too blue um, uh, because of the discontinuous color spectrum, but that can be corrected, but not for the purpose of this, this test here. Even setting the color balance to 3400, which is halfway between the two of them, really doesn't help either part of the photo. So the, the takeaway here, guys, is that um, you can't use different color temperature lighting when you're doing layout photography. It just, it, you'll never get accurate color. Now, again, I'm speaking to you as a professional. As a professional, if, you, if you're looking to get your photos into a magazine, you need to have good color. Now, what, what might look good to your eye and might be okay on, on Facebook or your website is not going to work for a magazine. Trust me on this. Um, so for the purposes of this comparison, I shot one photo in camera raw and then set the white balance to the stated color temperature of the particular light source. Even so, the colors were not entirely accurate, especially for the background light, which as I said, was, is still slightly blue. For the most part, when I shoot layouts, I will turn off the overheads and use professional studio lights. In cases where I have to work with an avail available fluorescent lights, I'll augment the lighting with an inexpensive clamp-on reflector using a 200 watt um, equivalent compact fluorescent bulb like you see in this photo. Now, in this picture, this, you know, this will give, this, this is the setup that I used with that. I had overhead fluorescent lights and I used the fluorescent um, bulb in the simple clamp-on reflector. This is something that anybody can do. The key though, is I match the light 
color temperatures. The overhead fluorescence were 4100K. This reflector and bulb is 4100K. And that gives a relatively flat overhead lighting, um, a little direction or punch. Think of an overcast day with indistinct shadows. As you can see here, this is the shot that I took with that setup. Perfectly acceptable color. And um, it's kind of a nice overcast looking photo. Um, Dennis, to, to, to measure the light and so forth, you have a meter that you use for that? How do you, how do you measure? Well, yes, I do. Um, as an old film guy, Jim, uh, I have a handheld light meter that I use. But here's the thing, with digital photography, the camera's auto exposure gets you pretty close. What I use my meter for is I will meter the overall scene or the actual shot, I'll meter it, I'll see how my camera agrees with that. But really the big purpose of the meter as I use it now is this is a relatively um, tight shot. The background is right behind the camera, behind the, behind the engine and the foreground is right in front. It's, it's very narrow. The depth of field on this is extremely narrow. However, if I were to shoot across a layout and had a lot of stuff in the background, I'd want to make sure that the background lighting was about the same relative exposure as the foreground or what I'm shooting, my subject. And so that's what I use the meter for. I will go around and just, just handhold the meter and move along the layout to see what the layout lighting is in that particular shot. Now, for, 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 for somebody that uses a point and shoot, what, what you're saying, as I understand it, Dennis, is that the, the background, the foreground, and the middle of your shot have to have the same light source. Yes. They have to have the same, it, it should be the same color temperature and the same type of lighting. Got it. So. Got it. Oftentimes I will use, I will light my foreground, but then I additionally have to light the background. Okay. Yeah. So um, uh, in this case, with this little tank engine, the overall, or let's call it the ambient light, let's call it skylight. That was the fluorescent tubes overhead. And I matched that color temperature of 4,100 degree Kelvin. They were shop lights, fluorescent shop lights are 4,100 degrees. I matched it with a bulb. Um, right. so, um, uh, that's, that's where that, that is. Um, thank you. All right. All right. So let me see, where do we go next? Okay. Now with that said, we're going to talk about color rendering. And here we have a bunch of, we have several different, um, shots. Now these were um, three different shots. Each one was taken with the particular light that you see right above the shot. So in the first left-hand shot, I used my professional panel light. These are, these are uh, professional photographic panel lights. They're not cheap. And as you can see, it's a thousand watt equivalent um, and it's 3,200 degrees Kelvin with a 95 color rendering index. Now, what is that? It, color rendering index is how accurately light, a light source will render colors on a scale from one to 100. 80 is, you know, 80 to 90 is, is good. 90 and above is excellent. Well, for all intents and purposes, that's not something that you really need to worry about. Color rendering index is, is only, it only becomes critical when you're doing something for, let's say an advertising shot and it's clothing and the, the, the advertiser wants to make sure that that clothing color is exactly the color that is on the clothing. Now, for model railroads, 
it's, you know, it's irrelevant really. Um, the, the, the middle shot was with a 200 watt CFL bulb like you saw before at 4,100 K and that has an 82 CRI. And as you can see, the colors are pretty, are pretty close to one another. The third one is an LED utility light, um, 150 watt equivalent, and that's rated at 4,000 K with 70 CRI. And yet, when you look at all three of these pictures, they look pretty dang close. Now, what I did do though, um, is I shot these in raw and I then went into Photoshop and I used the auto white balance in Photoshop to see how close it would come to these temperatures. Because when you use auto white balance, you're actually setting the color temperature. So in auto balance, this panel light registered exactly 3,200 degrees Kelvin, but there is a little slider which will, will, will change the color from sort of green through red a little bit. It, it will balance the color a little bit. That one didn't end up in the middle at zero. It came over a little bit, again, because even professional um, panel lights like that one still don't have a perfect color spectrum. The next one, um, that one was listed at 4,100 K, but when I did an auto white balance, it looked at, it, it came out at 3,950. And it was over much more in the, in the uh, scale, red, green scale. And the final one, that one came out at about, oh, I think it was 3,900. K and it had the most deviation in the red to green scale correction. But when I corrected all, all three of them, you can see that they're pretty ding dang close. And that would be, that would be more than enough for <laughs> magazine reproduction. And it's more than enough for anything that I do professionally, uh, unless I had to be extremely critical. Um, uh, at any rate, when I do professional work, for the most part, I'm using professional studio lighting. And that it's not just panel LED lights. I also have the typical studio tungsten lights, um, Fresnel lens, uh, heavy duty lighting instruments that will throw a beam. So um, uh, that, that will take care of that. Now, you're going to run into the different types of files that you're gonna get when you shoot um, digitally. And this is where I'm probably gonna end this. We'll talk about this briefly. Um, and next week, uh, I will be talking about everything we haven't covered here, which is gonna get more into the aesthetics and the camera um, for photography. So let's just go through RAW. First of all, think of RAW as a digital negative. It's uncompressed and unprocessed image data captured by your digital camera and shooting in RAW will capture a high level of detail um, with large sizes of files and a lossless quality. The direct image data means you start with a high quality image that can be edited, converted and compressed in a non-destructive manner. Like I said, think of it as a digital negative. When you set your camera up, when you're shooting in RAW, you can set it on um, auto white balance. You could set it on the wrong white balance. It really doesn't matter because all the settings on your camera are doing, um, like the color settings, the white balance settings are doing, is telling your camera or whatever monitor you're using how to look at it. And so it's really not something that's baked into the, um, the actual file. Now, TIFF files are a handy way to store high quality images before editing, editing if you want to avoid a loss, lossy file formats. 
TIFFs are lossless form of file compression, which means they're larger than most, but they don't lose image quality. So when I get done in Camera Raw, I do the basic editing in Camera Raw, like brightness and contrast and tweaking the white and the black values. Um, then I will, I will go into Photoshop and I will, you know, I, I will do some cropping or, you know, maybe clean up, like cleaning up any little spots or changing some things. And then I will save that image as a TIFF file. And when I submit an, uh, a file to the magazine, they want either raw or TIFFs. I do not send out raw files because I don't want anybody messing with my original. The TIFF file is exactly how I saw the picture to begin with. And if you give somebody a raw file, they can change it drastically. So I don't do that. And um, um, nobody ever bugs me about it. And if they did, I just wouldn't, <laughs> I just wouldn't do it. So now JPEGs, most of your cameras, even um, your point and shoots and your phones, maybe iPhone is a little different, but a lot of your cameras will automatically output in a JPEG, even if they have raw, even if they, um, you know, so point and shoots especially will output a JPEG, but most of them offer TIFF files or raw files as well. Um, and the same thing with a digital single lens reflex, um, they will usually want to output in um, uh, JPEG unless you tell it, unless you change it. So um, at, at any rate, that's where I'm going to end this today. So if anybody um, has any questions, um, please uh, speak up or forever hold your peace. Anybody have any questions for Dennis? Yeah, Dennis, this is Tom Farrell. I assume a JPEG and a PNG file are the same. You get you have image loss quality, is that right? No, actually PNG, I believe, is a pro Photoshop file, is it not? Um, uh, PNG is, is actually, if I'm correct, now I'll have to, because I don't use them, but I believe it's another file that is lossless, not not a uh, a lossy file. That's good to know. Dennis, this is Ron Walters. Um, does the lens make a difference when you're taking a photograph? In what respect? Do you use a wide angle? Do you use a standard? Do you use a telephoto? Or do you use all of them? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes um uh and that is something that i i can talk about this now i will show you um uh next time um if anybody is interested in me talking about it now i can but i don't really have a, fi a photo that to show you um some really striking differences and i want to point out I'll point it out right now because it's one of my pet peeves. Um, you've asked that question because uh, a lot of people, and I'm not saying you particularly, but a lot of people have the impression that a wide angle lens is, um, will give you greater depth of field than a telephoto lens. Now, <laughs> your depth of field depends on three things. One is the lens, um, you know, the, the, uh, the millimeter of your lens. The other is how close you are to your subject. And the third one is the aperture, okay? So um, uh, if everything else is equal, in other words, if you put your camera in the exact same position, with a wide angle lens and a telephoto lens and take the shot, you're going to have greater depth of field with a wide angle lens. However, if you move your camera all the way back and zoom in and fill the frame with the subject from, let's say you start at, at uh, A 
and then you go over to, let's say, C, right? If you have A to C in focus or in the shot from one edge of the shot to the other in a wide angle shot, and then you go back and you do the exact same thing with your telephoto lens, guess what? The depth of field is exactly the same. The photo won't look the same, but the depth of field will be the same. Whether you want to use a, a, a telephoto lens shot or a wide angle shot depends on what you're trying to do with the photograph. And like I said, I use every, every bit of the lens. The reason I asked the question, Dennis, is that um, a lot of cameras come with a standard 55 or 50 millimeter lens. And guys don't know that maybe a better shot could be uh, taken depending upon where you place your camera with a different lens. And a lot of camera companies will try to sell you, obviously, because they're going to make money, the telephoto or the wide angle uh, uh, to help you. When I was taking pictures as a high school photographer, as a teacher, um, I needed all three for various reasons. Um, and my students, of course, were all trying to take the pictures with their standard lenses that came with the cameras. So uh, my pictures always turned out better than theirs because I knew which lens to use for which situation. But that's the reason I was asking the question. Often in a layout, you may not have the room to use certain lenses and you have to stick with what you, the room you have and, and uh, the distance you are from what you're trying to photograph. Exactly. Um, um, the, the problem today that I see I see over and over most almost every digital camera you buy today not not a not a single lens uh, 35 millimeter I'm talking about a digital camera comes with a zoom lens okay now back in the film day we used three different lenses and we learned how to shoot with three lenses <laughs> they're all different and they all have and since you're an old film guy too you know exactly what I'm talking about the problem today is, and maybe you've seen this, I see people will put their camera on a tripod, set the tripod where it's comfortable for them at their eye level, wherever they feel, plop it down and then zoom in to frame the shot. They don't even think about what lens they're using. And that is a problem. Because you need to think about, I see it, and I'm sure you do, you see your photos, oh, that's a wide angle shot. Oh, no, that's a, that's a medium shot. Or, hey, that would look great as a telephoto. All right? So um, that, that's, where, that's where I'm coming from. Here's another thing that I use a telephoto shot for, especially when I'm doing layouts. Most of the time, not most of the time, a lot of times, the background is terrible. Somebody has a great layout and they have a concrete wall in the background, right? Well, obviously I'm not gonna shoot the background. If I have to, then I end up having to do some Photoshop work, but I try to avoid that. So what do I do? I use a telephoto. If you, the, the, you know, by compressing the depth of field, you're also compressing the angle of view and you can eliminate stuff that you don't want to see. And, um, and it looks perfectly natural. But again, you, you have to know what each of those lenses will do. And unfortunately today, people don't do that. Any other questions? Well, Dennis, thank you so very much for this evening and looking forward. Dennis will be back next week uh, to continue this discussion. So, Dennis, thank you so very much. Uh, I learned an awful lot tonight from you, and I really do appreciate you taking the time to be with us. Well, thank you. And um, if anybody has any other questions that you would like me to address next week, just tell Jim. Please don't tell me. Just send an, <laughs> just send an email to Dennis directly. <laughs> yes, you can do that. Uh, and, and Dennis can put his email address in the, uh, the chat function, and uh, 
He's, he always responds to me. I'm sure he'll respond immediately to you. So if you have some questions or, or things that you'd particularly like for him to cover next week, uh, send him an email. So okay. Dennis, thanks so very much. Hey, thank you guys. I appreciate it. I hope you, everybody had a good time. Absolutely. Thank you.